Application security is hard when security is separated from your DevOps workflow. Security has traditionally been the final hurdle in the development lifecycle. Iterative development workflows can make security a release bottleneck. With GitLab, security is built into the CI-CD process. Every code commit is automatically scanned for security vulnerabilities in your code and its dependencies. Results are delivered to the developer in their native workflow for rapid remediation. Learn how GitLab enables DevSecOps. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash GitLab for a 30-day free trial. In a fast-paced tech environment, the potential attack surface increases with each release and new app created. Detectify automates cutting-edge knowledge from trusted ethical hackers into the development pipeline for reliable application security. Go beyond the OWASP Top 10. Check your web apps for over 2,000 known vulnerabilities actively exploited in the wild, monitor subdomains for potential takeovers, and remediate security issues in staging and production. Learn more with a free trial at securityweekly.com forward slash Detectify. Go hack yourself. Welcome back to Application Security Weekly. I'm your host, Mike Shima, joined by John Kinsella. Do you have a specific guest or topic that you want us to cover on one of the shows? Submit your suggestions for guests by visiting securityweekly.com slash guests and completing the form. We review suggestions monthly and we'll reach out to you once reviewed. If you missed Security Weekly Unlocked last month, you can now access all of the content on demand, whether you register before the live event or not. It's free. Just visit securityweekly.com slash unlocked and click the button to register or log right in. Ah, uh, the news. Uh, John, you did mention that we've got a, a fun article to go into that ties us to our previous discussion with Taylor. Um, but I'm biting at the at the bit here, to chomping at the bit, to talk about a really cool vulnerability in Kindle, Kindle Grip. So I, I, I don't think I can, can uh, hold off and, and not talk about this because it ties together a couple of my favorite things. So a researcher here. Um, was poking around and in their write-up described a lot of the attack mentality. And that's one of the reasons that I really like this article too. And basically says, you know, while looking at the various libraries present on the firmware in Kindle, one stood out, libjpeg XR. Um, and so what was interesting, this JPEG XR is kind of an obscure standard. And uh, any time you have a parsing of images or text or video, for that matter, or audio, there, there's probably going to be some problems. And of course, lo and behold, um, the researcher found a pretty straightforward um, the buffer overflow within this uh, within this parser. But that's the first thing. The second thing that was really cool is that it's they wanted to not only say, cool, I found a vuln, but I want to pop this vuln and generate an RCE. And poking around a bit, they looked around and, and discovered a way of doing an injection attack, except there seemed to be a regex pattern that was looking for integers and integers only. Now, at first glance, um, this regex pattern looks correct. And this is one of my pet peeves about regex patterns. You always need to anchor them at the beginning and the end of a string. So in this case, using the caret zero through nine, and then a dollar sign. So ostensibly, this should be digits and digits only, but, and this was the other cool part about this particular attack, is that the researcher said, cool, I'll use a multi-line string. So basically now they put the number one carriage return and then their um, some string that they wanted to execute their favorite command. So. All of these together, as you can tell why I haven't let you get, in, get a word in edgewise, because I was so excited about this one, it was a great combination of image parser, pretty straightforward vuln, figure out how to pop that vuln, and then bypass a regex. So um, did I leave anything out, or is there anything left that um, you want to bounce the rubble on for this poor particular vulnerability? <laughs> It, you can hear from my sniggering. Yeah, this 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 uh, tickles me pretty well as well. Yeah, I think the one thing you left out is they even got a uh, um, uh, a screen capture or a bit of a, a output from um, running a netstat command on a Kindle, which that in and of itself just sort of blows my mind. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, this this is you know um, this is this is it's it's a fun read. It's it's not too long, not not too buzzwordy, so it's readable for folks. Um, but what's interesting to me about this is, you know, as as I shift back to my developer self and I'm doing a lot of code reviews, um, pull requests and stuff like that. If I think about like the the, the code smells, I sort of look for when I'm 
you know, if you're ripping through a code review, anyone who's done this on GitHub or whatever, um, you're not going line by line and thinking about, okay, how does this, I mean, you could do that, but usually you've got 10 other things to do. So you're sort of ripping through. And from my uh, professional days doing code reviews, what you do is you gather a sort of a, either a list literally in a file or sort of mentally of like smells you're looking for in a code that, that might have issues. Um, let's see, how many of them did you just mention? Uh, regex? <laughs> Uh, using some strange library that the developer thought was cool, but no one's actually thought about from a security point of view. Um, the the multi line one, we'll call that part of regex. Um, yeah, it, it's it's. I think what would be interesting is how do you um, how do you get the developers to uh, and use? It was sort of one of the first things you said there too. How do you get the developers to sort of um, step out of that little box that? any of us tend to, to get into and sort of think about, you know, as I usually say, the, the, the jiggling the doorknobs or how do you think about things from that another point of view and not just sort of from the point of view of becoming a hacker, but I think once you once you think about the other side and back to like we were talking about last half, uh, you know, having um, some level of empathy for what's going on, I think if we can uh, instill that in people, that'll eventually get them to start thinking about, okay, well, I found this cool library. Oh, hang on a second. Has anyone thought about security in it? And like, I think even just having that little pause there would prevent some of these. And now this is Amazon, right? So this isn't a small little open source project. So I would presume this is going through some level of code review and pen testing and stuff like that internally, which makes this a little more interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, it's a fun one. Yeah. And I think you know, to, to build a little bit on what you were saying, too, uh, what the researcher here pointed out is that in the reference code for this um, open source, this libjpeg XR, there was, in fact, an assert condition that was making sure that um, this particular security assumption wasn't broken. The, basically, the, the offset um, wasn't greater than the buffer that was allocated to hold the, the, the data. But what, was, what he noticed was that that assert wasn't carried over into the implementation within uh, on the Kindle version. And there could be a couple of reasons for that. So we'll, we'll pick a little bit on the fact that this is C, but I think I'll try to generalize that more and say, it's possible we could have done a, as you're describing a code review, seeing, oh, here, here's some uh, integer multiplication, it's going into a buffer, that's a bit of a code smell, that could be scary because you know the, the attacker might be able to influence the size of that buffer. Um, ah, okay, there's an assert that blocks it. But if that assert isn't carried over, or if at the compile time the asserts are removed for performance reasons or they're optimized out, suddenly mm. you've had a code review that was successful, um, but now you have a behavior that's changed between the debug and your production build. So there's definitely a lot of landmines here, to use another metaphor, um, that, that, that can go wrong in this type of approach to software. And I think you sort of hit it there. One of the more interesting things when you talk about um, uh, those those nasty little compilers and optimizing stuff out, I bet that's one of the more common, one of the more beneficial uses for using a fuzzer, right? So everyone mm -hmm. thought it was coded right, um, compiled the unit test, passed fine, QA looked good, but it's not until you really sort of poke at that thing in the right way um, where some of these bugs are going to come out. I think so, and I think even in the the, the regex part, because what what's interesting about regex is is that the behavior of the regex can be influenced either in the pattern itself. You can try to assert is it multi-line or not, or it can actually be influenced if it's a multi-line or single line by the uh, flags to the parser. So you can also have a couple of surprises. This this impedance mismatch between what you expected the pattern to do, and how the parser is being applied to the input. So um, hopefully a fun read um, because it's Kindle. There's my pun for the day. Um, and drawing a picture of insecurity, and um, I think a great thing to to read through, and also just well written. So um, check out the article. Give it a shot. And um, with that, we're going to awkwardly segue into um, other things perhaps that are confusing, such as cloud and APIs and analyst reports or analyst style reports that uh, you, were, you were foreshadowing in our previous discussion with uh, Taylor. So lead us into this one about, I believe, Radware, John. Yeah, this is a, this is a, um, a, a, um, a good paper if I can figure out where tab it is. There it is. So, um, Radware put out the study, and, and quite honestly, it got on my radar because our marketing guys are like, "Hey, what do you think about this?" Um, so I first did the, the that you know the 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 
my job. Um, and then I came back and actually started reading through it a day or two later. And man, I'll be fully honest, I've been sending this paper and talking about this paper for most of the last half of last week. Um, and now today. Uh, and, and sort of what's interesting about it is, so it, it's another paper. And it, it, every time I think about it, I keep, I still haven't gone back and read. Um, there was another paper that came out a week or two ago, another study. But anyways, this one's what we're looking at now. Uh, and it's what's interesting about it is on some of the cases how they actually take a stat, which we already know about, um, and sort of, you know, sprinkle a little bit of, of heavy thinking on it, if I can dare use that phrase, and, and sort of look at it from a different point of view. So one of the ones that caught my attention was, um, yeah, 71% of respondents mostly or completely trust the level of security offered by their cloud service providers. Okay, 71%, that's pretty good. But then if you think about that and sort of shift your point of view on that, that means that 71% um, mostly trust that their customer data won't be compromised by a bad actor. Oh, yeah. well, hang on, just what? So it's, it's um, and I think, at least for me, the, there was, I mean, I've been telling, I've been telling even our designer, literally like our graphic designer, to, our, our UX designer to read just the pull quotes out of this. 92% um, of organizations, in 92% of organizations, security staff have no say regarding the continuous integration, continuous deployment architecture. Um, you know, so it's, it's things like that. Uh, oh, this was a fun one. 98% of respondents reported attacks against their applications in 2020. That means 2% of them have no clue what's going on. <laughs> um, you know, and it's just, there's all sorts, of, it's, it's, um, it's, it's me doing my style of sort of high level sort of sketching throughs. But even when you actually read the text, um, you know, I can do a full book report on this one. I've read the whole thing. Uh, I think it's, it's um, a good one to, to read and pass around and think about. I agree. And there was a, there was a poll quote that, that stood out to me too um, that I think ties in nicely to our previous discussion. It was that in nine out of 10 organizations, uh, security staff are not the prime influencer on application development architecture, nor its security budget. Now, the security budget, that's a little bit scary. I would hope they're influencing somehow on that, but um, not the prime influencer on application development architecture. And that ties in a little bit what you were just saying about, you know, are, how are they looking at the CICD? But one of my questions there would be, if you're this org that you think you fall into that 90%, let's figure out why. Is it the fact that they're not invited to the table? And if so, that's likely an easier problem to, to solve. If it's the fact that the application team or the security team doesn't have the knowledge, the domain knowledge of how do we build software? What are the great ways to build privacy by design, security by design, to call out two of our uh, January 2020 and January 2021 episodes here on ASW? Um, that's a little bit more concerning, um, just as much as just in general in terms of what you were saying about visibility. Hopefully, um, you know that you're being attacked, but also hopefully you know, rather than just having an attacker-centric mindset on what type of things are hitting our website right now, just looking at that application development architecture and saying, what's the best way we can do this securely? So that that was the soapbox. That, that's the book report I'm going to write just on that sentence alone. Mm -hmm. You know, there was one more in there, which is it's could be a bit of a bummer for our listeners, um, but also hopefully something they can change and then we can run on. Um, is this the graph? I think it is. Yeah, uh, Figure Twenty Five. Um, where will app, where will organizations invest to improve application security during the next twelve months? This is I don't think it's quite the same one you were talking about. Numero uno, API protection. Well, of course, we're talking to an API vendor here, so um, numero dos, uh, uh, web app. Uh, sorry, WAFs. And then it's not till number three that we say, oh, yeah, we, maybe we should hire some more security experts. Um, I, I, I hope that improves a little bit, right? You know, it's if you're, th this is that problem we've had for years and years of, of buying tools to solve security. Um, I think we know by now pretty well that that doesn't work. So hopefully if, if Radware um, uh, customers are listening, they'll, they'll think about that a little bit, not to get them to lose money, but, um, you know, it's, let's, let's place our, our things where we need to. 
yes, let's be strategic. Let's read the, as Taylor would tell us, uh, let's read the, the tea leaves of these types of reports and figure out what's the strategic response here. And I think that might give us a way to um, segue into um, some really cool Project Zero work, because I think this ties very much into the idea of not necessarily application development architecture, but application architecture, and both security tooling from the perspective of fuzzing or any type of AST, to code review, to understanding protocols. And so it, it was hitting all of my favorite things too. So this was my second favorite article <laughs> of the um, <laughs> of the week, uh, partially because just last week in episode 136, we were talking with um, Andre Serban about fuzzing. And we mentioned state machines because state machines, much like parsers of a image format, like libjpeg XR, that's a state machine to figure out here's this frame or here's this other frame, here's the color shift, et cetera. In this case, Natalie Savanovich of Project Zero was looking at the state machines of WebRTC and basically the audio-video protocols of a handful of messaging um, systems, uh, messaging apps. And what was really neat is that basically she came across a couple of vulns, as she said, by accident, um, and then pretty much found vulns in everything from Signal, which in the case of Signal was a bug just in their code. So it wasn't a misunderstanding of the protocol, which is a common problem. It was just implementation error. So it was, that's just an example of these are the types of mistakes that humans make. Um, but then also calling out, um, looking at Duo, as in the, the, the Google um, messaging app, not the... Um, company doing 2FA, um, but even Google was a mistake, you know, had made some um, implementation errors for this about handling callbacks and race conditions that were coming up when the way it was handling channels uh, between AV frames. Um, so a lot of these were pretty interesting. And one more example that I'll throw in here as I give um, John some time to read through and, and organize his thoughts um, was uh, 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 we're giving you behind the scenes of how we run a broad podcast live is that Facebook Messenger. This was pretty interesting because there was an initial comment that it was harder to reverse engineer. So talking about C and C C++ based applications, the symbols were stripped. Um, they were statically linked. So basically, the only code that's in Messenger is the code that Messenger actually needs and executes on. There's nothing extraneous in there, which can make it a little bit harder to reverse engineer. But what a little bit harder means is just maybe it takes a couple more days or a couple more weeks. I think in the case of a Google Project Zero researcher, it's more like a couple of hours to days, um, but it doesn't defeat reverse engineering. And this also goes back to that idea of does access, how much does access to source code versus just access to the binary make a difference in finding vulns? And maybe it mostly is just a difference in time to find those vulns. Because in this case, um, sure enough, um, she found some great interesting vulnerabilities in the signaling mechanism of Facebook Messenger. Um, so lots of cool stuff there. Another, again, pretty good, great read. Definitely gets a bit more technical, um, but I think in a very um, accessible way. So let's see, John, did I stall enough for you to uh, catch up on some, <laughs> uh, some interesting things here? Yeah, I, I feel like um, my college days when I was trying to scrambling to read a um, uh, a paper before a, a quiz at the end of class. Um <laughs> No, so I think you know what's interesting is it's technical. I wish she went a little. I, I wish it talked a little more about setting up to do some of these tests. Mm -hmm. um, so as as a result, showing what she found in there, I think that's cool. Uh, I think it's really neat that she, um, uh, a Google people actually were even you know talking about their own software. So um, thanks for that. Um, the, the results are are you know they they speak for themselves. And it's funny when you were talking about. Um, when the bugs, the bugs she found in Signal, <clears throat> see, I was even listening. Uh, the bugs she talked about in Signal, uh, it's frequently when you know when you're coding against something and you run into something like that, not either from a um, uh, um, an analysis point of view or a coding point of view. It it takes a little bit to try and figure out. Okay, was that is that a bug? It, that it am I misunderstanding something, or did they misunderstand mm. something, or is it this third party thing we rely on? So um, it's always interesting to see those. You know, it, it's they're those are the ugly ones. It's as I've said to people, you know, anytime at a security vendor when we have to like try and build a um, a POC for like when you see us do a demo on stage or all these different types of things, like for some reason one of the run C ones is coming to mind. Those things are frequently a lot harder to actually set up and test and actually hack and exploit 
in a repeatable manner than you would think. Um, I think maybe, as I'm talking, I think we've talked about this before, but so it's it that that neuron fires here with with this and how she's finding some of these things and. Um, yeah, it's we haven't talked. I don't think state machines have gotten a ton of. Um, excuse me, my computer's going crazy. I don't think state machines have gotten a ton of attention over the last few years. They were sort of sexy for a while, and then I guess people sort of got used to them. So it's it's good seeing this coming back and um, thinking about this because again, from a code review point of view, actually keeping track of how do you um, uh, switch from one state to another and making sure that you've handled all the cases correctly, that that's um, easier said than done. Easier said than done. And and um, you reminded me of the, and one of the other things I wanted to highlight about this article is that if you look at it, the, the, the mindset was saying, ah, I want to go look at some protocol and some protocol implementations. And I want to look at some state machines. How does how do how does an app handle authentication, then authorization, then signaling, then the back and forth communication of audio and video frames? And what was really neat about this is that that mindset and that threat model modeling mentality was applied against several different um, uh, messaging apps, and lo and behold, was quite successful against all of them. So this was one of those cool things is that you're not necessarily investing a whole bunch of time just to analyze signal, and then all of that mental effort is lost. If you're approaching this from a neat protocol analysis way or this abstraction of state machines, you can reapply a lot of that thinking, a lot of that um, um, uh, mentality towards other apps that are that are just like this. Um, so I think that was that's a great thing to highlight. Um, the the other thing I want to highlight, switching now to just other information about how thing what can happen when things go bad. Um, this was um, from Bishop Fox, so uh, consultants um, who put together a article about bad pods and. This one, I think, was, um, I don't know that there's anything necessarily new and surprising here, but again, it falls into this category of very nicely uh, written, easy to um, understand uh, summary of just what can happen when you when you give up root. Um, we have to say that since Matt's not here, hmm. or you have some other weakness and you're not adhering to least privilege. So it's a really good way of just understanding, um, looking, read this through and saying, does this match the threat model you've been applying to how you're deploying your own Kubernetes infrastructure? Okay, hang on a second. I need to read this through. No, I already did it actually. Um, uh, yeah, it, it's it's interesting. You know, what are thoughts, nice dichotomy between these two uh, articles. Um, you get to see, and it's something I try to um, mentor engineers through. You get to see how an how an engineer actually writes a, a paper for these type of things versus how a consultant does it, um, and how you communicate this information out to people is is really important, right? So either to, to, will they are they going to read and accept and understand and learn, or are they going to go that's geekery? Um, it's us geeks will read each other's stuff, but if you want to try and get it up the the food chain, not so much. Um, from my read, I don't think it covered a lot of new material. Um, I think it, it did a good job what it covered. Uh, I think it's laying out those sort of points through different ways that um, <sighs> these nasty, complex Kubernetes things can be sort of, um, can bite you in the butt. I, I, I think it's, I think that's going to be one of the interesting trends we see this year is um, how do you make this Kubernetes security thing easier? Uh, there, there's so many moving parts in it. Um, and I think that that's, you know, it's it's. I think as as people not just look at a, a a paper like this and read and understand and think about it, but um, not thinking about it from the point of view how do they um, how do they actually apply that to their existing clusters or bring in Bishop Fox and get them to help you. Um, but how how do we make this uh, Kate security easier in general? And I think that's um, that's going to be one of the harder things to do, but something we need to focus on this year. No, that, that, that's a great point. And I'm going to use that to talk about both the aspects of communication and communicating to, you know, non-engineering or perhaps even non-security audiences, as well as um, protocols again. And highlight that. So NSA published some recommendations on uh, DNS over HTTP. Now, th there's not a direct AppSec um tie-in here necessarily, other than I would highlight, for example, DNS over HTTP 
tends to be perhaps that's more for the browsers and for the endpoint users, which is still important because developers are developing, um, to reuse the word, uh, the, a software on their endpoints. And so that is a, a source of entry, that's a potential entry point for malicious software. If they're visiting a uh, malware site or they're otherwise have been infected with malware that is reaching out via DNS over HTTP, which mostly I'm getting to this point saying that you're you're possibly losing visibility into what are the domain names that our endpoints are visiting. I'm going to set that aside now that I've got that little preamble out and maybe try to pull it into the idea of how much are you able to monitor, how much are you able to control what either your production systems are reaching out to or your build systems are reaching out to in terms of domain names pulling in Ruby gems, um, NPM modules, et cetera. So there is a sort of tie to supply chain in this concept of network monitoring, figuring out that you're actually, how do you know that you're connecting to non-malicious sites and having the visibility and where do you put that visibility? Because um, you know, with network level encryption, you potentially have to move where you're monitor where 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 you're monitoring for for that type of traffic to get the to get real rich signals, and um, I've run out with other ways to try and tie that into a good AppSec story. So, um, John, if there's anything else you have, or we can move on to talk about clouds and data security. It's it's funny. I got a few on this one. So funny. The first thing is. Um, <sighs> Get out of my head. Uh, I just finished reading Neil Stevenson's Fall, uh, and a <laughs> good chunk of that I, – I didn't like the book. I liked the first half. The second half was not that great. But um, one of the concepts they had in there is they were putting this person's brain uh, that they had scanned into a computer, into a you know a large network of computers cloud. Um, but one of the problems was they had they had this was in the future and everything had to be secure and we all had like you know um, something like blockchain or one of those crappy things. But uh, so they couldn't actually see the communication between nodes because everything was encrypted. So they could only do um, signal analysis to figure out what the uh, um, sim simulated brain was actually thinking. So there's my um, you know sci-fi an uh, analogy for the day. But um, my first thing when I saw this in the news was. Wow, NSA is recommending uh, DOH. So yeah, not AppSec, but um, and, and your description was right, right? This this argument's been going on for a year or two. Do we run? Do organizations run encrypted DNS or not? Um, there there's benefits for the good guys and the bad bad guys either way. But now that presume it's going to go, there's like five different versions of or three different versions of encrypted DNS. Um, yeah, it, it's you know. So bringing those two back together, both the the sci-fi and this, it it's a pretty big deal, right? You know, it's how do you when we talk to developers about how to um, how to productionalize an application, it's not just about making sure it's secure, um, but is it logging? Do we have metrics coming out? Do we know where the hotspots are? Is it scalable? There's all these different types of things. But bringing it back to this one is when it comes down to troubleshooting, am I able to get the information out of it? And actually, see what's going on. Um, and then where's that balance, right, between I want to log a good amount of information so I can understand what objects or data structures actually causing the issue, but I don't want to log those sensitive data bits. So um, there's a bit of a balancing act there around that. Um, and it's unique for each each organization, each application. Uh, and we've seen, you know, there's a lot of uh, um, tracing apps come out, tracing libraries come out over the last few years. So there's a bunch of different ways to handle this. Uh, but this this sort of allows people to think about it from a, I guess, higher, well, sorry, lower down the stack. Yeah, I think that you're touching on that last aspect too. I'll, I'll use the term visibility to describe what you were you were um, just just sharing with us, and that way I think gives us a good segue into this other paper from uh, Google Cloud that's talking about um, starting a data security program in a cloud native way. Now, um, we've been talking about analyst reports, vendor reports, and so on. Yes, this is from Google. It mentions GCP, but I think you can pretty much just redact all the GCP specific jargon of which there's actually very little, and this is a really good template regardless of your cloud service provider. And what it boils down to, it, it, it's, it's saying here are three pillars to, the, to being the, an effective cloud-based data security strategy. One would be identity, and this identity is not just humans, you and I, um, John, but also machines, also 
possibly John, depending on how sci-fi future we're getting with his brain, um, but as well as the applications, their data store, and it's talking about everything from the, the, the life cycle, from create, modify, store, as well as delete. And it was actually nice to see delete being explicitly called out as part of that life cycle. So there's one, identity. Then of course, it's talking about access boundaries as the second pillar. Um, in other words, what are the identities and can they cross the boundary? You know, show your passport, show your multipass. There's our sci-fi reference. And um, the third one, and this is where the long-winded segue comes, is visibility. Saying once you have identity and these guardrails in place for access boundaries, how do you watch what's going on and have that visibility? And at what, le at what level of encryption, of whether network or endpoint, is impeding one type of visibility and you need to shift to another and improve improve logging while also balancing the fact that you don't want to necessarily log all of your secrets and sensitive data and passwords and so on into a log store that is generally then just now a wealth of information for attackers to go and pull all those secrets out of. Um, so yeah, so really cool thing. Um, I'm going to, I'm running out of breath. John, save me here. What, <laughs> any, any reactions to this one? Yeah, well, first, Mike, we need to be honest. The only reason this caught your eye is the first sentence opens with William Gibson. Um, <laughs> and the only reason it caught my eye was it was, it was partially exactly. written by Anson Tavakin. So there goes two of us. Um, and then my third complaint here is uh, Google needs to understand how to do this right. When you click on the white paper link, it downloads the white paper. There's no page where you have to give away half your information. So I, yeah, it's obviously a failure <laughs> on their point. Um, Seriously, it yeah, right? And this sort of comes back to some of the last, well, probably the last what we've been talking about the last hour. There's so many moving parts um, in cloud, not just alone in, in Kubernetes or these different things. But um, I think what caught my eye in here is is the way they talk about, and it, it, this is a little bit of a slippery slope because it's a cloud provider saying it, but realize that... Um, and these guys believe this too. I've I've had conversations with Microsoft folks where like they they hundred thousand percent like they're like you need to do it this way. Don't just write your application and bring it into the cloud. But you know realize we've got tools which are designed to work at scale. They're designed to be secure. They're designed to be all these things. So don't just you know um, it requires actually embracing the cloud provider maybe a little bit closer than some people want to and their product suite. But at the same time, what you get out of that is is being able to scale and use those tools. So, um, and they've thought about these because they're talking to all these different customers um, and, and looking at these from different points of view. So I think there's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty good thought piece, right? Um, that this is the type of stuff, well, I, I'm, I'm not gonna go down that path. Um, it was a good thought, but I'm, I'm stop fawning over Anton. Uh, it, it's, there's a lot of really good stuff in here and, and I think it's, it's, it's a little meatier, but worth a read, especially if you're going down this path towards coming into cloud, right? A lot of us have been sort of talking about this for years. How do you adopt the cloud securely, all that type of thing? So I think if, if you or your org are still sort of going down this path or you just want to go back and, and think through, um, have we done it right? How can we improve? I mean, these vendors are coming out with products quicker than we can shake a stick at. So what new things are out there that um, might be able to help us as a company? I mean, what landed on my radar last week was Amazon now has a, a secrets manager. And I know they've had it for a while, but I was going back through looking at things, thinking about, did I want to run Vault? I can, you know, I think it comes down to about $4 per year per secret. I can give that secret to Amazon and let them manage it for me. So there's there's things here to think about in, in the pluses and minuses of both sides. Yeah, I th think that's a great point. And I think what, one of the, the important takeaways here is to to kind of emphasize what you were getting at, too, is that there, there's no lift and shift. That if you're going into the cloud or you're starting in the cloud, take advantage of what cloud-based patterns should look like. And an identity that is using certificates for, for, for identity, um, having a CA infrastructure that's actually relatively easy. So as you point out, AWS has Secrets Manager. It will handle a lot of those shared secrets, those passwords, API keys, et cetera, what have you, but it's also a great way that natively Amazon and the other cloud service providers have equivalents of it's actually a certificate authority and a um, CA framework that actually works. And I think we've been talking about this, we as the security industry have been talking about cert-based identity for, for a long time, decades if not. And there have been 
scattered success in certain ways. If you think all the way back to, um, I think, Lotus Notes um, is what I was trying to go for. Um, there is an old school way that had certificates everywhere and even encrypted email. Um, but wow, not easy to set up and maintain. And um, so now we're finally at the, the era, I think, that the service providers have um, figured out how to do, be able to do this at scale. And um, yeah, so read that. It, you don't have to be beholden to Google um, in order to take away a lot of the, the the concepts here and apply them regardless of your cloud service provider. So wrapping up, there were a couple of just a couple other points I wanted to get to and sort of round out the types of things we're talking about. Um, I, I have to oh, correct yes. you really quickly, though, first. Ooh, um, so Lotus Notes is actually nowadays HCL Domino, and it's still around. A moment of silence as I my brain... <laughs> flames out and smoke starts pouring out that wow i'm impressed and here i was going to yeah uh, you broke me down that, that's awesome <laughs> sorry um yeah uh i had a funny um, feeling so, i had to google real quick and yeah still there please go on i, I thank you i shall and uh we'll, we'll, security weekly will now be moving to a lotus notes um infrastructure so you can securely email us and give us feedback after the show um but joking aside <coughs> I will throw out um, a couple of resources on real world crypto. So talking about uh, encryption and crypto means cryptography, um, a really good online um, uh, conference. Some of the, the slides and the sessions are available. I just highlighted two. One was about EDE encryption in Zoom. Uh, we've talked about it before. Um, nothing really new there, but it's just great to hear other people talk about it as they were directly involved with its implementation. And there was another um, neat session called Mental Models of Cryptographic Protocols. And setting aside the idea that, oh, cool, protocols and cryptography and lots of math, the more important part was understanding users to improve security. And this takes us very much back to that old school GPG um, article of why Johnny can't encrypt. And so I think, that, again, we're sort of either revisiting a lot of known problems, but hopefully taking steps forward to, um, to, to fixing them. And then there's a final article about Firefox um, failing to load a fav icon from HTTP cache. Now, this one just tagging on there at the end as kind of an interesting discussion or interesting example of rather than a controversy of vulnerability disclosure coming out of bug bounty and the idea of a misreporting or even malicious reporting or say a bug bounty kind of there can be situations where they say oh i have a vuln but i'm not going to tell you what it is until you promise to pay me here were some researchers some academics who found some fingerprinting flaws in browsers except the fingerprinting flaw didn't work in Firefox because Firefox made a bug in the implementation of how they were just handling the fave icon. The researchers went in and said, hey, you need to fix this flaw, but they sort of left out the part that by fixing this flaw, the fingerprinting of users would actually work, and this would actually be enabling a privacy-based attack. Um, and then 11 months or so later, they came around and said, hey, any updates on this? It kind of unfolded what the security dimension of this was. It wasn't initially called out. So I think a lot of just some interesting lessons there, a, a good... Um, um, perhaps a water cooler discussion to have with your AppSec team and with your developers about how would you handle this type of scenario? Yeah, I'm, I'm still stuck on uh, um, uh, cache attacks and fav icons and that type of thing. Um, I want to go back really quickly since you just talked about yes. conferences. I forgot to mention before when I was talking about Radware that that was a really good segue or it should have been a really good segue to mention that Mike had a pretty good panel, a really great panel at a um, at our previous conference. So for people who want to go back, uh, there's something that for them to go and listen to as well. Oh, yes. Thank you. Yes. Check out the API security session on Security Weekly Unlocked. It's a lot of our panelists talking much more than me. So um, for, for, for all of you fans out there. Um, and there's also the Enigma conference. Speaking of conferences that are coming up the, I'm going to say the first week of February. Um, so it's not free, uh, but typically after the fact, they make the session recordings free and available. So uh, keep an eye out. We'll be covering those as any of them have any AppSec coverage for us and we'll keep you informed. Um, and with that, I think we've gone through our 30 minute segment for this time. And I don't want to further our Neil Stevenson and William Gibson uh, cyberpunk dystopia too much. So I do want to thank uh, John for once again bringing a good sci-fi mentality to our segment. I want to thank all of you for joining us and we will see you next week on Application Security Weekly.